Okay, I want to start again. My name is David Gross with Condi Systems, and I have my good friend Craig Mertens with Digital Art Solutions with us. Craig is uh, a pioneer in helping us uh, use Corel and get our money's worth out of it, and he's going to tell us all about it. Craig, how are you today? I'm doing well, David. How are you doing? All very well. How long has DAS been around? Well, we in November 14th, we're going to be celebrating our 24th year in business. So one more year to our big 25. And uh, so we've been doing graphic software and art content for the personalization and, and decorated apparel industry for coming up on 24 years. So we've been around a little while. And Craig, this is our 25th year about to move into our 26th. So folks uh, out there with uh, in Condi land, uh, you may have heard me speak at, and teach at some of the classes, but I tell everybody that I wake up in the morning, uh, of course, drinking the sublimation uh, Kool-Aid or really the sublimation coffee. Many of the younger folks don't remember what the, that saying means. And I have two things on my mind. Number one is what new products can we bring to market? So sublimation is all about the products you can make. And then number two is um, how can I help you make money? And so this sort of falls in somewhat in the middle there is Craig is a pioneer in helping you get things done at the computer. And so I'm going to turn it over to Craig and he'll uh, cover a few, I think, fun and interesting subjects uh, essentially to help you uh, with the computer. When we when I tell people about the sublimation process or the transfer process, for that matter, I tell them that we've got to be doing three things. We need to be able to make stuff that people want um, at the computer. Um, we need to be using our printer correctly, of course, and then we need to use our heat press. And so I think ultimately it's very easy to master the sublimation process. But I think most people get hung up on how to make stuff that people want at the computer, and they get hung up on, on sales and marketing. And so what we're going to do is we're going to focus on the computer, but I'm sure Craig will share lots of his wisdom. It's all yours, Craig. Thanks, David. Um, what I'm going to do next is I'm going to, I, you guys are looking at the Condi website real quick, but I'm going to go switch over to CorelDRAW. And this is CorelDRAW 2017. One of the things that I always recommend, if, if graphics is going to be an important part of how you earn a, are living for your family, um, it's pretty important to have a, a current version of CorelDRAW or at least one version back. Uh, one of the things that we run into frequently is, you know, Microsoft's pretty busy and Bill Gates is a pretty busy guy and they do all these service packs. So if it, there's nothing wrong with like Corel X7. Corel X7 is a good version. Unfortunately, it's not supported under Windows 10. So when people run into problems with Windows 10 and you call Corel Corporation, they're like, hey, sorry, so so sad, too bad, can't help you. So the two current versions of CorelDRAW that are supported by Corel Corporation are X8 and then the 2017 version. One of the things that we get questions about all the time, well, what about the home and student and the academic version? The home and student version of Corel is, is a defeatured version. And what I mean by that, it doesn't have some of the core functionality that is required to do third-party add-on software. So some of the things you're gonna see us doing here today, I can't do in a home and student. Academic version is a little bit different. Academic version is a full version, a regular version of CorelDRAW, but it can only be purchased by people that have teacher credentials. And there's a ver verification process you have to go through in order to do that through Corel Corporation. Uh, but that's a full version. There, there, there's only an X8 version of the, the academic. So whether it doesn't matter really which Corel version you're using, we'd like to see you in X8 or 2017. Yeah. So there's that kind Greg, of Greg, let me throw this in. We cannot support the home edition here at Condi because they removed color management from it. So we're not able to um, select our profile, our printer profile at, on output. So um, definitely, definitely need the the real version. I'm, I'm glad you I'm glad you mentioned that because that's one of the when we say it's a defeatured, that's the kind of the deal breaker feature for a lot of people is the color management's been removed. And bear in mind that version of the software is designed to educate people, not to be used commercially. So what you see here is the CorelDRAW 2017. And what we've got going on here, we've got some supplementary software that we're running here. All this stuff over here, this is our Smart Designer Pro add-on software for CorelDRAW. And what I want to do first, I want to talk about a couple of just fundamental principles of graphics that are really important. And one of the things that David and, and I talked about is setting up your new document window. I've already got my, my workspace set up, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to check one little button under 
general right here. Well, actually, we're going to go over to workspace general. And I've got curl set up to start a new document every time it opens. And that, that's pretty normal. The default setting here is the welcome screen. A lot of times people get tired of the welcome screen. And I personally do. I don't want to hear that little music in that video every time I open curl. So I've changed this to start a new document. And I've also disabled show new document dialog box. But that's something that you know a lot of times you want to have that up. And here, here's why you might have multiple production processes. So you might have a sublimation workflow, but you also might have, say, a, a, a vinyl cutter. And you want to have different settings, different document settings based on your page size and things of that nature. And so by default, when you open up a new document, Corel will open up the new document dialog box. And this is actually super important. And it, it's one of the one of the first things you do when you load up Corel Draw is, is to get this set up exactly the way you need it. And there's a couple little fundamental mistakes that people make, and I'll kind of show you those here in a second. So thing number one is you have you can name a document before you actually create it, and that's kind of handy. So if you knew what the project was going to be, you could name it right here. And you also see a little save button. And so you can add presets. So I've got a couple little presets that I've set. I have a Craig's preset uh, that's my favorite settings that I utilize. And you can change your page size. So if you know what your imageable area is or your, your page size for your printer is, this is where you'd enter it. And then your default orientation, whether it's portrait or landscape, this is where you'd enter that. And you can always go back and save that. Number of pages, people always ask, well, why do you, why do you need multiple pages? Well, it depends on what you're doing. If, if you're using page one as your production page, you could use page two as your proofing page. And uh, you could have like a virtual sample over there or a rendering of the product. You just got to remember when you go to print, you want to only print page one if you're doing that. Um, but here's the biggie. And Dave and I talked about this, I guess, the other day we were chatting is primary color mode. This is the cardinal sin of digital printing and specifically sublimation. So CMYK, what does that mean? It means cyan, magenta, yellow, and black. And CMYK was developed for initially for offset printing. So big Heidelberg printing presses, old school offset printing presses. And the way an offset printing press works is you have a plate and you have four colors of ink. You have cyan, magenta, yellow, and black. And that plate picks up dots of that ink, deposits, it's, deposits it on, onto paper. So if you have a dot of yellow ink and you put it on a dot of cyan, what do you get? You get green. That's how, that's how we create colors in offset printing. Unfortunately, the color gamut, which is the available number of colors that can be produced with CMYK is, is actually pretty narrow. It's, it's a fairly narrow gamut of colors. So we can't hit every color we want with CMYK. And here's where it gets confusing, okay? Guess what cartridge colors a lot of times your printer has? CMYK. So conventional wisdom says, hey, Let's pick CMYK because that's the colors in our printer. Your printer is capable of printing a much wider color gamut than versus offset printing. So we kind of handicap ourselves a little bit if we if we use CMYK. So what we want to do is actually switch that to RGB. And that's critically important. And when you guys do setups on your printers with Condi, they're going to tell you to do that. And, that, and that's really important. And that's true of, of really all production processes. We want to set that up as RGB because that way we have access to a much wider range of colors and brighter colors, especially. Also, you'll see rendering resolution. So I ask this question when I teach webcasts all the time. I says, hey, what's the maximum resolution we can output a vector-based graphic at? <laughs> People always throw out answers, 600, 1200, 300. Guess what? It doesn't matter. With vector-based graphics, they're not they're 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 not composed of, of pixels like a bitmap. They're composed of lines and objects. They're actually a math formula. So your highest output resolution for a vector graphic is whatever your printer is capable of printing. And so what that setting there is for is what's called a rendered effect in Corel Draw. What is a rendered effect? A rendered effect would be a effect that's applied to a vector graphic. And a good example of a rendered effect would be a fountain fill, where you're blending from one color to another. And so the maximum resolution for a rendered effect is 300. We want to leave that alone. Um, preview mode, you want to leave that as enhanced. Um, but here's the danger zone right here, color settings. Don't change any of this. Um, there's, there, you know, the, the, one, the one thing that, that I really appreciate about Condi systems is and when they're working with somebody on a printer, they really understand all this color stuff. And I know if one of our clients has a sublimation system from Condi that they've been walked through this process setting all their set, settings up. I know... One of the things that David had recommended is under reg rendering intent to change a rel relative colometric to perceptual. Is that correct, David? 
It is correct, and it's it's just due to past problems with the relative uh, relative color metric rendering. What that means is rendering intent is how do you handle what are called out of gamut colors. So if if the printer isn't capable of printing that color, what value should be sent to the printer? And so it's a fancy algorithm, and we get the best results from perceptual. And perceptual is really the rendering intent for photographs, but but relative color metric um, in the past has given us wacky results. Okay, that, that makes sense. Is there any other settings under color settings we want to be aware of at this point? No. Okay, so we'll leave that alone. And what we do next, hit OK, is going to save that. So that's going to be your default settings now. Anytime you open up a new document, document, and one of the things David and I talked about is, you know, default settings in Corel. There's a couple settings in Corel that are actually kind of handy, um, besides just your page size. And, and one of those settings is, if if you click on your text tool right now, you notice my default text size is 12 points. It's pretty small. And if you're working on personalization and say you're decorating a cell phone cover, or you're doing an apparel item or something of that nature, you probably want bigger text. So what you want to do is just click on your text tool and go to your drop down list. And then I'm normally going to pick 100 point and we're going to click on that. And here's the tricky part. Artistic text. That's a line of text. We want 100 point to be our default for a line of text. I don't really want 100 point, which is a one inch text, be a default for a paragraph of text. So I just want to click on that. The default color for Corel is a uh, uh, for black is actually the RGB, 100% RGB black is the default color for Corel. If you're doing a sublimation workflow, that's a that's a good color to use. If you're doing anything to do with screen printing, you would typically want to use Pantone matching system in the in the process black color for, for screen printing. But the default black is, is fine for your tools. And you'll notice that you have a default outline color here, and then you also have a default fill color. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to I'm going to change my default color back to that RGB color, and I'll show you how to do that. I'm going to go down here to Window, and I'm going to go down here to Color Palettes, and I'm going to click on RGB Palette. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to click on my text tool, and I'm going to left click on this 100% RGB, which is 000, that's the formula. And I'm going to say, you know what? That needs to be my default color for paragraph text and artistic text. And then the other thing I'm going to do is I'm going to click on any of my drawing tools right here. I'm just going to pick on the polygon tool and I'm going to right click on that black and we're going to make that the default outline color. So now if I draw something, it's that RGB black. It's going to be nice and black when I print it. Everything's good to go. And there's one last thing I'm going to do over here. It says lock ratio. I'm going to make sure that lock ratio button is checked because that means if I type a value in here, say six inches or five inches, it's going to scale proportionally versus stretching it in either direction. So those are a couple just simple little you know settings that I like to set up. And what we're going to do next is we're going to go to Tools. We're going to go to Options. And under General, um, I'm going to keep the Show New Document dialog box open. I've got it set to Start a New Document as opposed to the Welcome screen. So that's good. And then one last thing, Tools, Save Settings as Default. So these are now our default settings every time we open up Corel. And there's other settings and things that we can do, but that, that's, that's a pretty good, well-rounded starting point. So let, let's talk a little bit about bitmaps versus vector graphics. And what I'm going to do here is I'm going to open up a, a vector graphic. I'm just going to use Smart Designer to cheat a little bit. So I'm going to go down here, and I'm going to click on Load Last Used Template. So this was the last design I was working on, and pretty cool little design. This is a vector graphic. This graphic is composed of lines and objects, and there's a couple giveaways that will tell you that it's a vector graphic. Number one, in the status bar in Corel, which is right down here, you'll see group of selected objects. That's a pretty good clue. Um, if it's grouped, that's a pretty good clue. If it's a bitmap, it's going to say it's a bitmap. Now, if I zoom in here, you notice these lines are nice and smooth and clean. You don't see any jagged edges here. And so that's another good clue. But really, the best way to tell is if you just go to wireframe view, you can tell. This is this is the actual vector artwork. And what's brilliant about vector artwork, I can ungroup it. I can recolor it. The text is live. I've got basically the, you know, any option that I choose to, to modify and manipulate this graphic, I can do that because it's vector. So let's let's do something kind of kind of fun here. Let's take this graphic here. And I'm just going to size it down a little bit. And it's a little Corel trick. If you move it and you hold your control key down, it'll constrain itself. And I'm going to right click to make a copy. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to select that. I'm going to go to bitmaps, convert to bitmap. 
and I'm going to convert this to a 300 DPI RGB bitmap. And I'm not going to have a transparent background, but I am going to click on anti-aliasing. And anti-aliasing is actually kind of important when you're working with bitmaps. So what that does is it blends the edges in, so you don't get a real, you don't get that stair-stepping effect. Now, one of the unfortunate byproducts of anti-aliasing, it does create additional colors. So if you're going to use a vectorization process and trace something, that actually creates a problem if you're vectorizing. But for for working with good-looking graphics, they're going to look good on screen, or good look good in a in a web context of a web graphic, or for printing, anti-aliasing is generally a good idea. So we're we're going to click on OK, and we're like, whoa, what happened? OK, here's what happened. This has now been in 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 graphics terms, it's been flattened. It's been flattened into a bitmap. This is all pixels. And if I go over here and I go to wireframe view and exit over here to enhanced, it still looks pretty good. If I, if I pull back out, it still looks pretty good. But it's when you start zooming in here, you're going to see problems. And that's when you start seeing the jaggies. They're going to print. And, th and this right here, this is actually that anti-aliasing. And so instead of that being just a solid color, it actually is blending those pixels in along the edge. So the this graphic right here at 300 DPI, if you were to print this out at scale right now, and I think, how big is this? Probably about four inches. This is going to print great. This, this is great resolution. Here's the problem. This isn't what your customers give you. What your customers give you is something that looks a bit like this. You ready? I'm going to undo that. We're going to go down here and convert this to a 72 DPI bitmap, which is pretty typical of a web graphic. We're going to click on OK and wow and that's how it's going to print so the 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 trick when you're dealing with bitmaps there's lots of tricks when you're dealing with bitmaps most web-based graphics are going to be bitmaps the trick is the is you want higher resolution and larger physical size so if, if you take a photo off your digital camera and i've got um i've got my samsung galaxy s7 here when i take a photo off that camera at full scale and i import that into corel draw it comes in at like 60 inches by 40 inches. It's a massive file dimension wise, but it's only 72 DPI. So the DPI isn't actually as important as the physical dimensions. You can have a low resolution image, but because you have large visual, physical dimensions, you have a lot of data to work with. You have a lot of pixels. So let me, let me show you what happens if we double this. Right now, this is at 72 DPI. I'm gonna type in 200%. And now it's at 36 DPI, and all we did is spread those pixels out. And so it's going to actually look even worse as we go bigger. So when you're when you're when you're starting with source artwork, and you need to scale it up to do a larger imprintable area, the larger the physical dimension that you have, and the higher the DPI is going to give you the most options in terms of print quality. So I always like to explain that. And the other thing too is a lot of times people want to go trace these image images, and you can you can trace them in Corel Draw. Um, you're going to get a pretty crazy result if we go to trace this watch. You ready? Once I have it selected, Corel is context sensitive. And what that means is it will tell me what I can and cannot do with that object based on whether or not it's selected or not. So you notice once I select it, it says, oh, you're a bitmap. And it's telling me right here it's a 72 DPI bitmap. And it also says, hey, I can edit this bitmap if I click on that. And that's going to open up the graphic in Corel Photo Paint. I could edit that graphic in Photo Paint. I can hit save and photo paint. I can close photo paint and the image will just pop right back into Corel Draw. That's a neat little trick. A lot of people don't know that. You just, once you've edited it in photo paint, just hit the save button, close photo paint, and it'll pop right back into your Corel Draw. But the other thing I can do is I can trace it. So if I go over here and click on trace bitmap, and everybody's getting, always gets all excited when I do this, and we'll do outline trace and we'll, we'll call it clip art. And it's going to give me a little preview here. And then I'm going to say, Specify color, remove color from entire image, and we're going to use the dropper here on the white. And so we just knock the white out, and we're going to hit OK and retrace it. And we're all excited, and the traced results right on top of the bitmap, and voila, guess what we got? A disaster area. And the reason we've got a disaster area is real simple, because you just don't have enough data to work with. The image is too small, it doesn't have enough resolution. And there are certainly some deficiencies in the tracing engine of Corel Draw, we we don't use in our company we don't use the Corel tracing function. We have a specialized software called Smart Vector Pro that's light years ahead of Corel in terms of tracing bitmap graphics. That's what we typically use. You can get a good result in Corel Draw if you have very high resolution images and they don't have to have a lot of if if they're more abstract. Um, if it has to have straight lines up and down and a more precise thing like a logo 
it typically people are going to notice that it's not quite perfect. If it's more of an abstract type of image, you might not notice. So, so, so in order to get a bitmap to a vector, you either got to trace it, you got to redraw it, or you got to have somebody else redraw it. Those are your, your pretty much your three options. And the question you're going to ask is, well, I don't want it to be a vector. I'm just going to print it. Here's why you want it to be a vector if you're going to print it is you can edit it. And so that means I can very easily go in here and swap colors out. I can change the text and we'll, we'll do that real quick. So here's our original image and right now it's grouped. So I can select on that text right there and I could hit control shift T and I could change that to another text value if I wanted to. That's the advantage of a vector graphic. Now, this design started out as a design template meaning our art department we created this we built it we it's our clip art image it's all what we call production ready so we can just print it but i want to go through the process of creating a graphic and and color correcting it so i can show you you know basically what that process is so i'm, I'm going to talk a little bit about color correction and it's interesting i have a good friend his name is jim conquest and he's a he's got a big printing business in california and he does a lot of teaching for roland and I asked Jim, and because he's a he's an industry expert, I asked Jim, I said, hey, Jim, what's the best way to color correct a vector image? And he goes, easy, print out a color chart, go to the chart, pick the color you want, because you know what it's going to print like, and recolor the image to the color in the chart. Oh, okay, well, that's what we always have been doing. He says, is, is there no better way? And he said, well, I mean, if you want to get a densitometer and get your monitor calibrated and all that stuff, he says, it's still not going to look quite right. The best way to do it is to actually just print a chart out. And so... One of the things that we've done in our smart designer software, and I'll show you that real quick, is if we go over here to our color management section, a couple things. Number one, uh, we've got specialized color management functions here, but number one, we have a little thing here that says print color charts and swatches. And so if I go over here to my drop down list and I want to pull up a specific chart, like a RGB chart or a halftone chart for screen printing or the Pantone solid coded chart, um, or our rhinestone chart, or most of the co or color shirt chart, that's the old sawgrass chart. I can just click on that and the chart will come up and I can I can print it. Now, here's the thing, what are you gonna print it onto? So here, I'll tell you a great story about that. I had a client, called me up, he was printing tiles with a sublimation system, and he said he couldn't get these colors right. And they had to be, it was for a home decor company, so they had to be perfect. And so he said, I don't understand how to get the colors right. And I said, well, what size is the tile? He says, well, they're four inch by four inch tiles. And I said, well, does the tile company make a 12 inch by 12 inch tile? And he goes, yeah, they do. We'll buy one. He goes, why? Just print the chart out onto the tile. That's your color chart. Anytime you need to print tiles out, just go to your tile and boom, there you go. And he's like, that's a great idea. And he'd already gone through three or four 12 inch or four inch tiles just to get the colors approximately right. So, so let's go back through that and explain why that works. If you print out the chart onto the product, OK, there's no doubt as to how it's going to look, the colors, there's no doubt. If you go to the chart and you pick the color number or name from that color and you recolor the image in CorelDRAW to that color, it's going to print perfectly. There's no better way to do it. And here's where it gets tricky. It gets a little bit tricky is co different color substrates handle color differently. So, for instance, let's say you're doing a vaporware T-shirt and it's white. Colors look one way on it when it's white. Now, let's say you do a light gray or an ash or a yellow. It looks totally different. So what you would do actually is you'd have to print that chart out onto the different substrate colors that, that you frequently print. And we have some clients that are big volume producers that do online shirt sales and a lot of one-offs. So if you go into their you know, offices, you'll see all these t-shirts pinned up on the wall that have their color charts. So they know that, hey, this is yellow. Let's pull these colors and that's color correct because their artwork is being submitted by, by, by uh, people that are ordering from their their website so what we're going to do next is we're, we also have a little thing here it says create color swatches this is a macro that you can download from corel draw we we've built this into our smart designer software but if i click on this and i go create color swatches i can actually create a little color swatch book and i, I did that this morning this is how we create our swatches. We format them a little bit differently, but you'd use a little open button here and then you would navigate to the palettes on your, your website and you got to go up a, you actually have to go in up a directory here and you got to go to your color folder and you go to palettes and you can just select the palette that you, that you want. And the Pantones are all under the uh, spot palettes. And the, the palette that we're interested in is this Pantone GOE coded, Pantone Go coded. And David and I talked about this the other day is the, the original Pantone matching system is a great color palette. It's the old school color palette. 
And, and, and the reason, part of the, one of the reasons that that palette exists is if you think about it like this, if you're a corporation or let's say an entity, Arizona State University, that's right in our backyard. Arizona State University uses Pantone 123 as their official gold. That's, that's their gold color. So when people are producing apparel or promotional products or any kind of product for ASU, ASU has, has a guidelines book. You can download it. And it has all the Pantone colors, and, and you know that you be, best be using Pantone 123. Well, what if you're an embroiderer? Well, if you're an embroiderer, guess what? Madeira has a chart that says, hey, Pantone 123 is closest to this thread color. What if you're buying heat press vinyl? Guess what? Thermoflex from specialty materials, they have a chart that says, hey, this color of Thermoflex is the closest to Pantone 123. Same thing for screen printing inks. So... When you're doing digital printing, guess what? You got a much wider gamut of colors, so you can print pretty much whatever you want. But it doesn't necessarily guarantee that it's going to turn out the way you want on screen. And I had a, I had a client, was, was, I, I want to say it's a funny story. It's, it's funny to me, but she called me. They had a, they're a retired couple, and he's a retired Air Force veteran, and they're at some kind of a veterans reunion back east. And they had a, a sublimation printing system. I won't tell you where they bought it from. And uh, she was printing out the Air Force logo, and she goes, it's coming out brown. She calls me, she's freaking out. She goes, it's coming out brown. And they had never really printed with this printer before, which was not a good idea. And uh, so it's the, the gray is coming out brown. And I said, well, she, th she said, well, is my printer defective? I'm not sure what's going on. I said, well, just print out the color chart. I says, what are you printing on? She goes, I'm printing on vaporware t-shirts. And I said, well, just print out the chart onto the vaporware t-shirt and then pick the color you want. The, the closest ma closest match is the Air Force logo, the blue and the, and the gray. And then just use your smart designer to recolor it and then call me back and tell me how it worked out. And so she calls me back and says, work perfectly. And I go, that's how you do color correction. You just recolor to that color. So the, the reason that we like the GOE Pantone chart is it's a more modern chart and it's, it's up to speed. I think that's the best way to explain it. What, what's your thoughts on the GOE chart, David? So you need a, a palette that has a lot of colors. So you got to paint the rainbow. And you need as close as you can get to 2,000 colors that would map um, uh, a lot of colors. And then from there, you get yourself a Pantone solid coated book, find the color you want, hold it up against a sublimated chart, and you're good to go. Yeah, what, what David's talking about, the book, you can purchase the little swatch books. I know nobody ever wants to buy them because they're expensive, but you can purchase the swatch book. And where, where that's really handy is if you have to do a precise color match, if you think about it like this, the customer specifies Pantone 123, right? So that's what they specify. But you go to your printed chart and you're like, wow, that really looks different than the, the color in the, in the little Pantone swatch book that you just paid 120 bucks for. It looks really different. Well, just look at 123 on your swatch book and just go through your printed chart and find the one that's the closest to it. And who knows, maybe Pantone 125 is actually the closest match to the, the little swatch book. So everybody's happy. The customer's happy. So you can use the regular Pantone matching system color chart. You're not going to get as bright of colors. You're not going to get as much breadth of colors. And you're going to run into trouble on some very specific colors. Specifically, red's going to drive you nuts. So, And that's a whole topic. David, I think we could probably do a whole webcast on getting a getting uh, getting a good red maybe maybe that'll be a, a future topic but um, yeah, let's do that but the bottom line is um, use the Pantone go we can uh, usually furnish a chart to you all, all set to go print it sublimated it's in letter size pages transfer it uh, maybe to a couple of substrates and then at that point in time uh, start using it so if you've got a school object hold the object up against the chart Find the color that matches, and I do it by page, row, column. And after you know the page, row, and column, you reopen the chart on your computer in Corel, go to that page, row, and column, click on it, and you're now painting with that color. Yeah, and yet, now the other thing you can do, and this is a tip that I give clients, you can create your own color palette, and you can create your own chart. And that's, I kind of want to show you how to do that. It's, it's a pretty neat thing. So this is, I use that little macro right here, and I use that macro to to go in and create my color chart. Only one problem, it's 83 pages because it's 20 up. And, and David has a chart that he provides for county system owners where it's, it's, it's condensed. So let's say I went over and I, and I had, I picked my favorite colors, my 50 favorite colors, the red I like that's closest to fire engine red and the blue I like that's the closest to what I consider royal blue. I can create my own color palette from that. And all you got to do is pretty straightforward. You just, you can do it by either by document or by selected objects. So I'm just going to, select that and and we're going to put it on a new page here so i'm just going to open a new page in corel 
is I don't want to do all 83 pages. So there's that. And it's a neat little trick. You just go down here to Window, Color Palettes, and it says Create Palette from Selection or Create Palette from Document. So I'll do it from Selection. And you name it. And we'll name this uh, Craig's Crazy Palette 2. And we'll name that. Okay, so there's our Craig's Crazy Palette 2 right there. And then you can print out just this this chart. And so what I would what I would do is I'd hand select my favorite colors and then just print that chart out. And we've done that already. We've kind of hand selected our our favorite RGB colors, and we did that primarily for DTG printing, but it also works well for for um, sublimation. And it's just a little DTG color chart, and it's a one pager. And this is what this kind of what we've done. But these are just some good colors that print real vibrant, vibrantly on a sublimation printing ink set as well as a DTG ink set. And every printer is a little bit different. So creating your own color chart is actually a really good idea. And, and it's even a better idea because it, it makes converting colors from one chart to another a lot easier. So what we're going to do is once we kind of got that worked out, we got our, our chart and I got a lot of charts open. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to close some of these up here. So I've got... If you ever want to close a chart, you can just click on the little arrow there and you go to palette, click on close, and you can close these charts up here. So and you can have as many charts as you want in Corel, and you can even change the number of, of colors in the in the color well. You can make that two wide or three wide. So what we're gonna do next is we're gonna go through a project and I'm gonna show you how to color correct it real quick. So first thing I'm gonna do, I'm gonna start with a new document and I'm gonna utilize the tools of Smart Designer to do that. And that's this going on over here. There's about 140 features that Smart Designer has added to the Corel workspace. So things that our customers, that an experienced Corel user might take years to learn, our customers can do it just by pushing a button. And that's that's one of my favorite things about Smart Designer. Now, when, when we're doing sublimation, typically our substrate color is gonna start out as white, but if we're printing onto a colored substrate, one of the things I could do is we have colors here from the common manufacturer. So I could pick Gildan right here. So I just pick on Gildan and here's the Gildan color chart and I could just pick the color I want and make that my background color. So that would actually change my background color and it won't print because it's set to don't print or export. So it'll change your page background, but there's no danger of accidentally printing it or, or exporting it if you're gonna pull it out of here as like a PDF file. So I'm gonna leave it white, but I just wanted to show you that. Now, next thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna click on select template. This is where it gets a little bit crazy because we've been doing templates now for 24 years. And so we have over 85 different volumes of design templates. So it gets a little bit, gets a little bit nuts. I'll, I'll talk a little bit about what a template is. Um, it is a real easy way to explain it. And what I'm going to do is I'm just going to click on a template. And this is from our Campus Pro Marketing System, which is our subscription-based program. And we'll go over here and we'll pick a, a category. And here's a template. So template it has text. It has a, oftentimes a design element like this border here, and then it'll have multiple, either a single clip art image or multiple clip art images. All the text effects are duplicated when you change the text. Any kind of text on a path or anything like that is retained. So if we change the text, it's, it's just going to reflow the graphics. So it's a really great way to, to create custom graphics. And, and what, what I love about these templates is they can utilize the full set of functions and features of CorelDRAW. So some of the online tools you, you see out there, they're very limited in terms of what they can do in terms of text effects and things of that nature because they're online tools. Corel has an infinite capability in terms of, of creating text effects, and I'll show you a, a really good example of that. These are, these are some of the things. This is one of our template volumes here, but these are some of the things that we can do with text effects in CorelDRAW that you're just not going to be able to duplicate in, a, in an online type of setting. So these are some pretty high-end templates here. And these particular templates utilize clip art from Great Dane, and we did, a, we did a cooperative marketing thing with Great Dane where we used his clip art, and then we built our templates. So this is a pretty good example of a, a pretty dynamic template for, for digital printing and sublimation. But templates can be about anything, and one of the things that we're well known for is monograms. And um, David can back me up on this. I'll, t I'll tell you a quick story about monogramming is uh, we had a client, I guess it was about four years ago now, and she, she's in Fort Worth, Texas, and she said, hey, Craig, monogramming is going to be the next big thing. And I said, hey, guess what? It already is a big thing. People have been monogramming forever. And she says, no, you don't get it. This is with heat press vinyl and sublimation. I was like, oh, I always thought of monogramming more for embroidery. So you can cut these monograms out on... Uh, you can cut these monograms out on your cutter. You can sublimate them. You can do cell phone covers. You do all this stuff with monograms. It's a huge thing in the South, and it's taken over everywhere, which it has. 
And so what I did is I went and purchased some monogram fonts and started playing around with them. And I was like, holy smokes, this is not easy. And I'm pretty good with software. I was like, this is not easy because you got to have some of these fonts. You got to like left, right, and center characters. And so you got a keyboard shortcut for the left, which might be lowercase. And then you got a keyboard shortcut for the right, which might be uppercase. And you got to have a special keyboard shortcut for the middle one, which might be control shift A. And then if you have a placeholder element like these diamonds, that's control shift, maybe D and, and another keyboard shortcut. And then they got borders. And so you got another keyboard shortcut for the border. And, you know, we love our customers, but I didn't want to have to sit and explain to people all the little tricks and nuances to doing one monogram font. And, and so what we decided to do is we decided to build them into templates, which is exactly what we did. And so these are these are templates, but they're monogram templates. So if I want to modify one of these, all I got to do is click on it and highlight the text and change it. And I'm done. So that's another example of a monogram. Um, and we've got we've got all our templates. We've got all kinds of templates, all different subject matter and things of that nature. And it gets a little bit carried away. So you've got like power clip patterns here if you want to apply pattern fills to things which is great for sublimation these you can actually vinyl cut if you got a cutter i know that sounds crazy these are what we call knockout designs where the text knocks through here one of the things we're uniquely famous for is uh, rhinestone multi-decoration and so we invented that process of creating uh, rhinestone uh, heat transfers with a vinyl cutter back in 2007 and so we're well known for that but what we wanted what we really want to do is just take that same little dog template we were playing with and we want to modify it and color correct it. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go over here to the template and we're just going to highlight it and I'm just going to click on that template and I'm going to double click on it and then we're just going to open it up in Corel. And when it opens you'll notice a little window that popped up over here on the right hand side. This little window is where you do your editing. This template where it says the word grooming right here is actually three different layers of text right on top of themselves. And so when you're when you're manually editing these in Corel, you'd have to select each layer of text. Easiest way to do that is through your object manager docker. That's probably the easiest way to do it. And you can highlight it in the object manager. I don't have to do that because I'm running Smart Designer. So all I'm gonna do is just use the property editor and go over here to edit text. And we're gonna click on that little button there and where it says petty pause. I'm going to change that to Belly Rubs, which is our local pet spa, and I am an investor in that place, unfortunately. Three dogs, and I don't even want to tell you what I spend every time I go on vacation at the pet grooming slash. It's a, it's a pet spa. Um, I guess that just means an expensive pet uh, boarding place. So we're just going to click on that. And a little trick here, you got a little shortcut here. If you need to change the case, you can just click on that. You just highlight the text, and then you can change the case right here. Just You have uppercase, lowercase, and tile case. So that's a little shortcut we built in there. And then where it says salon, we're going to change that. I'm just going to type in Scottsdale real quick. That's where I live. And then I'll just hit title case there. So all, the, all this stuff that's going on here can all be manipulated. So we can be... We can change the colors, we can change the proportions, but what I'm going to do next is we're going to swap out the artwork, and that's one of the things that we've been doing a long time, and I'll brag on my dad a little bit. My dad passed away in 1999. Um, one of the things that uh, claim to fame, the, pro the, the process of electronic clip art, taking clip art, which was originally on a piece of paper, and then it was a black image, typically on a piece of paper, process of taking clip art, vectorizing it, and putting it on an electronic storage medium was invented by my father. So over 24 years ago. So he was the first people, person to do it. And they thought he was a little crazy. And I remember our first art volume was, uh, it was, uh, it was we, we, we saved, it was 182 floppy disks. And we stored it in a hubby's diaper, Huggy's diaper box. That's how we shipped it. So we're, we're a little bit further along from there. But electronic clip art's really handy. And one of the things my dad taught me is like, you know, three things about clip art. You can never... Find it when you need it. So being able to find it's real important. Number two, it's typically not designed for our industry. So it might not look cool on a personalized product or be production friendly for a process like vinyl cutting. Sublimation is pretty easy. You can just print it. But other processes, the artwork has to be prepared a specific way. These are all production ready files. Um, so, and, so you can never have good enough good quality clip art. You can never find it when you need it. And a lot, oftentimes it's not created for our industry. So we, we like to use the term production ready digital art. So it's, it's ready to go. And so what we're going to do is we're going to click on show preview here. And I'm going to highlight the graphical element we want to swap out. So we'll go ahead and cl click on the dog. And what I'm going to do is I'm gonna, I can either browse for a piece of clip art, but I'm going to use a keyword search. 
And so I'm just going to click on the little keyword search button. And all the digital art solutions artworks keyword searchable. So I'm just going to type in dog, and I can narrow it down a little bit if I wanted to. So we're going to go in there, and you can see some of the Christmas stuff I've been working on. I've been working on new Christmas art volume, getting that all spruced up. Gets me in the Christmas spirit. Seems a little bit too early in the year for me, but what do you think, David? Is it too early to be thinking about Christmas? Oh, absolutely not. If you're marketing and you're selling Christmas gift items, you want to be in the middle of it right now. If you're if you're setting up a web store or you're going to be doing craft store craft um, shows and things like that, that's you want to be. This is it's never too early. So so let's see what do we want to put in here. Pick your favorite dog breed. Let's see here. Golden Retriever, of course. Yeah. Okay, you're gonna do a golden. We can do that. Where's my golden? I could have typed in golden retriever. That would have made it a little easier. Test. Okay. Our dogs are all mutts, so we're not going to find one of ours in here. But you know what? I'm kind of partial to this little Chihuahua guy here. So we'll do we'll do a golden on the next one. Okay. So here's here's what we're going to do. We got our clip art here, and we've got a production issue. You guys see what the production issue is? Colors. So we got a mismatch of colors. We got the color from the clip art, and we got the color from the template. So First thing we want to do is we want to address that, and then we want to specifically color correct the image to our chart. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to go down here to where it says Modify Colors in Smart Design. We're just going to click on that, and it's going to show me all the colors in our design. Now, if you have a mixture of color palettes, and let's say you have, this is customer supplied artwork, or it's artwork of what we like to call of dubious origin, meaning a graphic designer did it. You could have part RGB colors in here, part CMY colors, Pantone colors, all kinds of things. So what well, we have a little button here, it'll, it'll say convert Pantone. It'll automatically convert to the Pantone chart. So I can just click on that, automatically convert it. And then what I can do is I can do a color reduction or swap. So if I wanted to do a reduction, what I would do is pick the colors I want to keep. And I want to keep a pink, I want to keep a purple, and I want to keep a white. And we're going to hit reduce. And we're just going to do a reduction. Okay. Then the next thing I'm going to do is if I want to recolor any part of this graphic, um, because I have a preference, I can use my little dropper over here in Corel, and I just click on that dropper, and I'm going to sample the purple, and that turns over to a bucket. You guys see what it did right there? And then we can swap that out. If we don't like the results that we get, you just hit Control Z. And actually, what I would, what we should do on this one, is click on the purple, and make that part purple, and then click on the pink, and make that part pink. There you go. So that's a neat little Corel trick. You can use that dropper. It's a really handy little feature for recoloring things. And so now we got our colors, but we want to we want to localize these colors and get them to the colors that I want. And I'm going to do a crazy color combination. You guys are going to think I'm nuts when I do this. Okay, you ready? We're going to go over here. We're going to go click on swap. And I'm going to go over here. I'm going to click on pink, and I'm going to hit swap colors. So we're going to swap that. And the color palette we're going to use is we're going to use that Go palette. And so I'm just going to go down here into my palettes, and we're going to pick Go Coded. And I'm going to pick an orange, nice bright orange there. Click on that, so it's recolored that. And right here, I'm going to click on this color right here, and on the blue. And I'm going to swap that out with brown. I know, it's a crazy color combination. What is this guy doing? You're going to have to trust me. This is going to look really good. And then right here under where it says white, I'm going to click on that. I'm going to say swap colors. And I'm going to pick like an aqua blue. And these are trendy color combos right now. Okay, so we see you got that aqua blue. Now, if I don't want that white in there on that object, I can just ungroup that object. And then we can just take that white out of there and just delete the white. So we just want to ungroup the whole thing. Click on the white object and then delete it. There you go. So um, I also, I'm going to teach you something here. This is pretty neat. On this text, if you ever get one of these spikes, okay, do you guys see what that, that little spike right there? That's called miter limit. And if we click on this object, let's see, is that one layer? That's actually two layers right there. If we click on this object and we go to object properties in Corel Draw, you can change that miter limit setting 
and it's under outlines. So let's see here. Right here, the miter limit set to 10. We can set that up to 22 and see if we can get rid of that spike. Actually, we just want to do it on the outer object, which is that one. And so we're going to check that up to 22, and that'll get rid of that spike. You'll also see the opposite. The opposite is if you have spiked objects, like a star. I'll show you the opposite of that. So if you have a spiked object like a star, and I'm going to thicken this outline up real quick. See how they get nibbed off? Because the default miter limit in Corel is 45, so we're going to change that to 22. And we're going to click on that. And now it's a star again. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to change my default miter limit to 22. Watch. 22. Hit enter. Change that to a default for graphics and text. Save settings as defaults. So and now i got a default. I already had it at 22, but I've got a default of 22, so we don't have to run into that. So here's our design. If we want to play around with the colors a little bit more, we can do that. Um, pretty much digging the way it looks right now. I've colored it to my chart so we know exactly what the color is going to look like. And what we're going to do is we're going to save this. So I'm going to go over here and click on Save. Another big advantage for those of you that are running Corel X7, X8, or 2017. And I'll show you what that big advantage is. David, maybe you know this too. There's a button right here that says Embed Fonts. Corel has embedded fonts in documents for a long time. Somehow at Corel X6, they didn't want to pay Pantone, or it was actually Bitstream, they didn't want to pay them a royalty for their font embedding technology. So they got rid of font embedding. Well, what's that mean? That means if you got two computers and they don't have identical font sets, and you save a file in computer one with a font, and you go to computer two and it doesn't have that font, you're going to get a font substitution. It's going to tell you, hey, we're missing that font and we want to substitute it with something that's super ugly. And that's exactly what's going to happen. We don't want to do that. What we want to do is we want to have the font embedded in the document. So in Corel X7, X8, and 2017, they went back to font embedding. And so when I save this, the person on the other end, if they're editing this file, and they have Corel X7, X8, or 2017, the font's embedded in the document. You can always tell if the font's embedded because in the font drop-down list, it'll show as an asterisk. If you ever see an asterisk next to a font, that means you don't have it installed and it's, imbe it's, it's uh, embedded in the document. Now in Corel Draw 2017 and X8, Corel's added their own font management program, which is awesome. And you got the little Corel font manager here. And the Corel font manager lets you access every single font on your hard drive in Corel Draw without having it installed. I know that sounds nuts. So I've got, I'm a font pig. I got like 16,000 fonts and different folders on my computer. And I don't want all 16,000 of them showing up, but there's a few that I really like that I don't use all the time, but I really like them. And so I can use the font manager just to, to set them up in groups and, and have them available to me, even though they're not installed. And that's a, that's a really awesome feature in CorelDRAW X8 in 2017, the Corel Font Manager. So next thing we're going to do is we are going to go and set up a virtual sample because we want the customer to see what this is going to look like. And so what I'm going to do here is I would go into Smart Designer and click on Virtual Samples. The old, old school way of doing this would be to go online. You could go to David's website and you could go to Condi Systems and you could... You could pluck a, a download the, the product templates that Condi so generously provides their clients. It's one way to do it. We're going to do it in an automated fashion. And what we're going to do here is we've got product blanks right here. And I've got stock product blanks. And I also have product blanks that are already set up. And the apron wouldn't be too bad that are already set up. And what I did is I just download these from the Internet. I draw a box where my imageable area is, and the software will automatically put the product on there. So here, let's do that, or the graphic on the product. So we'll click on the apron here, and it's going to take the graphic, and it's going to put her on there for me. So there's our design, and I can change the imageable area if I want to. So we can go and make it bigger, smaller. So I'm just going to grab the graphic, and this is your proof. So this is what, if you don't learn anything else today, I would teach you. Two, three things that are actually will teach you four things that are really important. This is the key to success. I've been before this life. I was a manufacturer's rep in the printed sportswear industry. Before that, our family owned the largest screen printing and embroidery business in the Western United States. And I pressed my first shirt on a heat transfer press in the basement of my parents. It was an Instapress, believe it or not, David, in 1970. Wow. And, uh, 
So I've been doing this a while. I was about four years old. And here, here's the trick to the whole deal. You got to give the proper tools for the job. That's critical. You have to have the proper tools for the job. It's my opinion that CorelDRAW is the right tool for the job for doing professional level graphics in our industry um, for lots of reasons. Number one, it's economical. Number two, it's easier to learn than the Adobe products. And I've been using Adobe products since 1988 and I can teach them and I know them inside and out. But if, it, if you're in an Illustrator or Photoshop and you're struggling, it's because you're normal. They're just complicated programs. People have a tendency to be able to pick up Corel Draw a lot easier. It's, it's much more of an intuitive program. And one of the things that we love about Corel Corporation is they look at Corel Draw as a platform for doing personalization. And so they put in specific features for, for that. And they also let us automate Corel Draw so we can do stuff like what we're doing right here. So you got to have the right tools for the job, which means you need to have a good printer from Condi Systems, the right ink set. You got to have all the right tools, the right product blanks, the right graphic software. You got to have the right tools for the job. Then you got to get trained up. And that's critically important, getting trained up, whether you're attending a webcast like this or you're going on Condi TV or you have written documentation. We're huge on training. So we do we do three webcasts a week. I know it sounds nuts. We do three live webcasts a week at digitalartsolutions.com. And then we've got hundreds of videos that are built into the software. And if I get a chance, I'll show you how that works. And then you got to make samples. That's the key. You got people got to see it. They got to touch it. They got to feel it. And, and, and it doesn't mean that the sample couldn't be utilized in the context of a Facebook page or a website. But if, if you want to open up the local booster club because, you know, they, they have a big time football program in your area and you want to get past the gatekeepers in the booster club, what better way to do it than to create an actual physical sample with your sublimation system? Find out who the buyer is and lay it on them. There's no better way to do it. It's the best marketing expense you'll ever pay. And, you know, we'll have clients and they'll, they, they actually allocate a budget to that. Every month we're going to spend $100 on bl blanks and do physical samples for prospective clients. You can do it virtually. And, and, and this is doing a virtual sample like we're doing here is, a, is still a great idea, but there's no substitute for a real sample. And the fourth thing is persistence. You just got to be persistent. You don't have to be the greatest salesperson on the planet if you have good looking products. If you have good looking products, they'll sell themselves. And uh, if you don't have good looking, if you don't have the right tools and if you don't have the right training and you don't make samples, and you don't have good looking products, it makes it pretty hard to sell. So sample sell. That's my dad beat that into my head. Sample sell, sample sell, sample sell. So let's make a little sales flyer here. And what we're going to do is. By the gonna... way, nobody ever throws away a personalized product. Yeah. And I've got one sitting on my desk right now from Google. Google sent me a the base for a Google Home that has my name engraved in, into it. And I'm like, why did they send me the base for a Google Home? It came in this fancy box and I opened it up and it says, if I call this number, um, I get a free Google Home if I go through their Times Hero presentation. But you're right, I couldn't throw it away. I was like, it's got my name on it. So I'm gonna go over here to proposal sheets. And uh, what we're gonna do is we're gonna pick out a proposal layout. So I'm just gonna pick out a, a layout for my proposal. And I'm going to get rid of this product. This is what I was working on yesterday in the webcast. And we're going to add this artwork. And we can add up to six different products in here if we choose to. And then what we're going to do is we're going to make a flyer. So I'm going to go over here to form data. This is where I'd put my customer information in because it's going to populate into the flyer. My company information doesn't change. I want to leave that alone. And I can also link this to my company logo. So this little button right here, if you want to link it to your company logo, you can do that. The, there's different fields. Every flyer has a different field, different fields in it. So some of the fields are like date or incremental numbers, or we have flyers that have credit card information on them if you're going to do fundraising programs. So what I, what I want to do is I want to pick out a couple little, couple more settings here. Um, and by the way, in, in this new version of Smart Design, you can add your own flyer layouts, which is kind of a big deal. So we're going to go to proposal sheets. Um, we're going to go to create and we're going to go to options and here's where we can put a, a watermark in here. So I've got it set up. So I've got a watermark in my, you'll, you'll appreciate my watermark here. And uh, we'll just click on create proposal. So we're just going to create a little flyer. And so back when, when my parents had their giant screen printing and embroidery business, we had a whole art department. This is all they did. We had six full-time people. We had 21 full-time production artists, but we had six full-time people, and all they did was do these virtual samples for our sales team. That's all they did. And uh, that was like a huge part of what we did. Also populated the colors from the graphic into the flyer, too. See that? And you guys like my uh, watermark there? That's kind of cool. So I'm going to get rid of that. It's not going to really hold anybody up. And then what we're going to do is we're going to make a PDF file. And if I choose to, I could have the graphic 
keyed over here in this box over here too if I want. So we can have that over there kind of isolated, maybe even a little bit bigger. So here's our professional looking sales flyer. And we're just going to click on PDF, save as PDF. And I'm actually going to hand you this file. You guys are all going to be able to download this file. So I'm going to go to my desktop and we're going to call this belly rubs. And what we're going to do is when you're making a PDF in CorelDRAW, you ha you're not going to use the save or export function. You're going to use the publish to PDF function. This little button in Smart Designer is just a shortcut to the publish to PDF button. You have different preset settings for PDF files that have different settings. And the one I'm going to start with is called PDF for editing. That's good and it's bad. It's good is it's the purest form of PDF. So it, it's got all the right colors. Colors don't change. The fonts are embedded. It, it's the purest PDF file. Okay, and it's a great file if you have, ever have to get a file from CorelDRAW over to somebody that has Adobe Illustrator or Photoshop. It's absolutely positively the best way to go. But here's the here's the challenge. I'll go over here to settings, and we're going to go over here to color. Output colors as native. We want to leave that alone. So when I put the native RGB colors under document, this is where I could go in here and put keywords, copyright. I'm going to spell that correctly because that's actually important. 2017, that's creating a legally defendable copyright. It's an embedded in the document. And it also is going to stamp the date and time and my serial number into that PDF. So if I ever have to go to court because somebody stole my artwork, I can prove that I was the first person to create it. Now you go over here to objects. Under objects, there's all kinds of different things you can do under objects. And there's different types of compression. LZW is a lossless compression, meaning it doesn't lose any image quality. In this particular graphic that we're saving, there's only one part that that is a bitmap, and that's the, the apron. Okay, that part's the bitmap. Everything else is vector-based. But I can, I can change my compression right here. If I go to a, what's called a, a JPEG compression, I could go to a JPEG compression. That's a lossy compression, not lousy. So you will, you, you will lose a little bit of image quality, but I can shrink this file down even smaller. And kind of the magic number is about 180. So JPEG compression. Um, bitmap downsampling, if you, if you click on these settings right here, they'll actually reduce the size of the bitmap and has a dramatic effect on the, on the, uh, the file size. So I'm going to come down here and just, I'm just going to change this to 150. And um, compress text and line art, you always want that checked. That'll shrink your, actually will compress your vector graphics. And this file is actually going to have the fonts embedded in it. So it's going to have live text in it. So it's a perfect file. If you have CorelDRAW Illustrator, you could suck this back in and edit it, except I'm going to put a password on it. So I could put a password on it and I could protect you from editing that file. You can't edit it. And I'm not going to put a password on this because I'm going to send this file over to you guys as a PDF. But if you got one of those kind of semi shady clients that you don't trust a whole lot and they're going to you think they're going to take it over to their brother in law, this would be a, a pretty good move would be to, to put a password on it. So we're going to save up that PDF there. And this is actually a rhinestone proposal sheet. So if there was rhinestones in here, it would actually tell me the stone count and if there's any vinyl in there too. So you can delete that page if you don't want or that segment. But what we're going to do here is we're going to go to the handouts. And on your control panel for go to meeting, if you're on a live event, you can do this. And I'm going to go over to handouts. And the first thing I'm going to do is go find that file where I put it. Let's see. We called it belly rubs. I'm going to figure out where I put it real quick. It says it's on my desktop. Hmm. Sometimes when I do these dual monitor deals, that it's on my my other little copy onto my other monitor here. Let's take a gander. It's not over there. Hmm. Interesting. Greg, if you know the first letter, I'm just click the first letter and it will jump around your desktop. Yeah, that's what I was. The, yeah, I just did that. And it it's wow. yeah. It's, I don't know what's going. Hold on. Published a PDF, unless I sent it in another folder. Didn't put it in my documents folder, did I? But here's a better way of doing it. B-E-L-L. -L. 
you can actually do searches right inside your Corolla. There it is right there. It says it's on my desktop, just wouldn't show it to me. And I'm going to copy it back on my desktop. It's going to say it's already there. No, that's odd. Okay, so there's our belly rubs file right there. Okay, so I'm going to click on it, and that's going to open in whatever my default reader software is for, for Microsoft. Now, also, the thing that's neat about P PDF files, you can put them on your phone. So if you have an iPhone or if you have an Android operating system, you can do that, or your tablet. You can also put them onto... Um, your laptop you can host them in the cloud there's a lot of a lot of great options with the PDF file and they're also small so they don't occupy a lot of space because they actually have the vector artworks believe it or not is embedded in this file so that vector artwork is embedded right in here and so that's why partly why this is going to look really good if I zoom in on it you notice there's no jagged edges in there well the reason that's vector artwork it's actually that PDF file is actually vector artwork so what we're going to do here is we're going to take that PDF and I'm going to drag it over to Handouts. And you guys, if you're on the live webcast, you should, you should be able to download that. So that's that that quick. And what we're going to do is I'm going to go over here. I'm going to right click. And I'm going to go to Properties. And this file, how big is this? You can just hover your mouse over it too. 1.68 megabytes. And almost all that file size is relative to the, the, the apron. That's where all the file size is coming from because bitmap files are really, really small and really tidy. So, or excuse me, vector files are very small and very tidy. So that's it. I got it, Craig. So it's good. So there you go. Now, we have had problems. Sometimes people can't download these from the handouts. I can't explain why it doesn't work, but there's your handout. So what I'm going to do next, I'm going to show you some things that we can do with the photograph. Because what we've been working on is pure vector graphics, but I'm going to show you what we can do with the photograph. It's a little bit different. So with the photograph, what we can do, we actually have a volume of templates called photo templates. And there's a very specific reason I'm going to show you this one. Because this is going to be part of the promotion that we're going to do at the end of class. So promotion, we're going to do at the end of class. It's going to be time definite. Is anyone that invests in the smart designer software, going to get two. Smart Designer has its own volume of artwork that comes with it. So that's probably where, where we should start. So its own volume is called the Smart Designer Starter Collection. So we have all kinds of different templates and packages and promotions and things that we do. And so the Smart Designer Starter Collection is kind of a best of art volume that has a little bit of everything from, from all of our different products. And so it has corporate oriented graphics. It has power graphics for sports teams. It has sports templates it's got volume from our super fonts volume so it's got it's kind of a best of smart designer also has a rather substantial collection of clip art that comes with it and we also have athletic tales and, and weathered overlays and things of that nature but kind of our go-to volume of artwork is our ready art volume one that's kind of our that's our most popular art volume and that volume has clip it, clip art and templates for things like biker graphics cartoons dogs and cats like your golden retriever right there david you happy now um, oh, yeah. event related graphics, hunting, fishing, saltwater and freshwater. We got all those fun fish that you guys catch down there in, in, uh, in Mississippi. Um, military, we got a great military section and there's clip art that goes along with this as well. And then resort oriented graphics, sports, trades and tribal graphics. So it's a little bit of everything and it's great for sublimating. But the one I'm interested in is photo templates one. So I'm going to click on photo templates one and we are going to pull up this template right here and the template is going to open and we're going to name drop it just like we did with the other template so we're just going to go down here to the little edit text button here and where it says classic car show we're going to change that to air show and I have an ulterior motive for showing this because I'm going to show you a neat little editing thing you can do in Corel Draw, and we're going to change this to 2017 2117, that'd be pretty exciting. Okay. And then what we're going to do is when we go down to art, we're going to do it a little differently. When we go down to art, it says rectangle with a power clip. So this is a placeholder for a power clip. And we're going to use our clip art browser. Instead of swapping this image out, 
we're going to power clip it into the rectangle. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to click on this little button right here. It says select, and that's going to open up the Digital Art Solutions Clip Art Browser. And the Clip Art Browser will keyword search all the DAS artwork, but you can also tag your own artwork. So if you have specific artwork that you're using all the time, you can highlight it in the Clip Art Browser and apply a keyword tag to it. And that's real handy if you have, you know, local schools that you're working with or specific companies that you're working with and you're trying to access their artwork. That's a pretty handy thing. So you got two modes. You have the keyword search mode and then you got the browse mode. Now I'm going to, and I'm running dual monitors, so it's pretty awesome. If I'm running dual monitors, I can drag and drop this onto my other monitor and then just leave it. And I can also screen out images so I can have it look for just bitmaps. Just vectors are all supported, any format that's supported by Corel. Now, here's, here's the thing that's a little weird. If, 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 if you've installed Smart Designer on your system, you're going to notice a couple things. Files that have not previously been had previews in your Windows dialog boxes and your desktops are all of a sudden going to have previews. And the reason for that is we install a file preview extension into your Windows operating system so you can preview PDF files. SVG files, PNG, well, PNG files are already preview, and, but specifically AI and EPS files. And so you get previews for that. And the re reason we do that is so that you can do this. So if I go to my browse function, and let's see here. Here's my air show photos. And what I'm going to do is instead of replacing that, you see where it says power clip right here? I'm going to click on power clip and then we're going to double click on that and it's going to power clip that plane into that placeholder. Now here's the thing. The dimensions of this power clip are different than the dimensions of the actual photo. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to, there's a little button right here. It says edit or I can right click and say edit power clip and I can make this bigger. See what I'm doing it? I'm making it bigger. I can move it around a little bit, but most importantly, I'm going to go and color correct it. So I can color correct it right in here. So you guys ready? Check this out. While it's in the editing mode, I can go over here to bitmaps and go to the image adjustment lab. And this is one of the neater little things you can do in Corel Draw. And I'm going to go over here and I'm going to click on before and after preview. And I'm going to first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to set my contrast. And I can just go and move the contrast buttons if I want to. But kind of the old school way you do it and the way you do it in Photoshop, you select a white point. So one of your lightest points in the graphic. And then you select a dark point, one of your darkest points in the graphic, and that'll adjust the contrast. Now, if you want to bump up the brightness, you can do that. If you want to change your shading, if you're if something's kind of tinting out a little bit and looking at kind of a green hue to it, you can move that back. If it's if you have incandescent light and you're getting that kind of yellowy um, um, that yellowy cast to it, you can move these little buttons around here and your temperature. You can do all that. And when you're done, you can you can just create it. We'll just create a snapshot here. Create a snapshot. And then you can go between the original and the snapshot. You can compare them. And when you're all done, you just hit OK. And it's color corrected that. And I don't have to look how much brighter that is. At least on my screen it is. And then you just hit finish and you're done. That's it. And then you just go and do a color swap and you're off to the races. So that's the, the basic concept of utilizing templates. And so we just did a little bit of color correction there to brighten that image up for digital print, printing. And then the other thing that we'd want to do is probably go in here and, and recolorize this for um, utilizing um, our color chart that we're using. Now, another little trick you can do, if you use the dropper, you can actually sample color from the photo and go that route too. So do that too. That's a nice little trick. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk a little bit about training and some of the things that we do for training. We talked a little bit about the webcast, but in Smart Designer, you got a little button here. It says Tutorials and PDF Files. So if I click on that, and I click on tutorials and PDF files. What we're going to do is we've got movies. We've got there's 55 movies that are built into Smart Designer. There's another 35 movies that are built into our Rhinestone Designer application, which is our multi-decoration program for doing heat press vinyl and multi-decoration with rhinestones. And then art volumes have their own movies too. So for instance, when we do a new art volume, oftentimes we'll record videos and how to utilize it. So like on Smart Monograms one and two. There's videos on how to utilize that. We're one of the last companies that does written documentation. I know it's crazy, but we actually, I pour my heart and soul into it. And so here's our little color correction guide, which is not a bad thing to have. It tells you how to color correct in Smart Designer. Um, here's our CorelDRAW training guide. Here's keyboard shortcuts in Corel and little tips and tricks and 
all that kind of stuff. But here's the big one right here, the Smart Designer Training Guide. And Smart Designer Training Guide is a massive, you, you could take a community college course on this thing. It's 228 pages. It's everything you'd ever want to know about our production in Corel Draw. It also backs up all of the, um, it backs up all the videos that are built in the software. So if you want to learn what difference between a bitmap and a vector, difference between outlines and contour lines, uh, troubleshooting, how to pre-flight your graphics, um, all the basic Corel Draw stuff. And then we have specific chapters on, um, pop, you know, here's a typical thing, important concepts before you start. So this is stuff you gotta pretty much know before you start doing graphics. And then we have chapters on specific production processes. Um, it's kind of a big deal. Um, I'll tell you, if you read the whole thing, um, there's a little gift hidden in there, but I can tell you what page it's on, but we have a little promo code and a little gift. If you read that, you, you send me an email and then you get a little freebie. It's kind of neat. And then you also have catalogs. So if I wanted to see an art volume and what's in that particular art volume, in our way of working, two, two ways we would access, actually three ways we would access it. Number one, these art volumes are hosted on our website. There is, clients get receive a blind link, meaning their clients can flip through eBooks on our website, but nobody else, they don't know where it's coming from. It's just a dead end link and you can just click on the eBook. So you could you know, flip through all the pages of like Smart Monograms Volume 1 if you wanted to. The other way you can do it is we have a, a standalone little program. We provided the CD and on that CD is a little program. And that little program you can put it on a USB driver, you can copy it on any computer and it's got a standalone little viewing software for the PDF eBook so you can be portable. You can put these on your phone, you put them on your Android, or I'm just operating it off my touchscreen computer. What's nice about touchscreen, touchscreen is I can do this. I can just sit there with the customer and we can flip through all these different concepts <laughs> on the different types of things that, that we can do. And I think I lifted that off your website, David. Hope I'm not in trouble. So, You're okay. Okay. All right. And uh, so these are, this is, this is the typical way that customers will communicate graphics to, to their end user. And so kind of that grid thing that David was talking about, and they could say, hey, page 34, CTW B09. And so these are all set up for sublimation, or you could use them for heat press vinyl, or people even convert them into embroidery. So, so that was pretty much the last thing I wanted to show you. We could spend a lot of time getting into all the kind of nuances of Smart Designer. It would take me, you know, several hours to go through the whole feature set, top to bottom. It's kind of a big deal, but I wanted to give you guys a really good overview of, you know, kind of how color works in Corel Draw, and then also an overview of how you can color correct an image that's vector based take a template, localize it, and then print it. So the last thing we'd have to do is print this. And I just want to show you a couple of little things that David and I talked about this. One of the things that's really nice about Condi systems is when they when you buy the printer from them, they're going to tell you exactly how to do the output side of things. They have their own color profiles for the printer, all that kind of stuff. But there's two little settings when you go to print that are really important. And we're going to go down here to print. And we're going to go to color. And we want to make sure under rendering intent, that perceptual is checked, and then color conversion performed by Corel Draw. Is that correct, David? Yes. And then I want to go to my printing. Then you'd go to your printing preferences for your your printer, and, and County would tell you exactly yeah. how to Let's set the, those. Um, go back to the color just for a second. Um, I'm going to switch myself. To I'm going to switch myself over to color mode here. Okay, so color. All right. Yeah, just uh, you'll see down there correct colors using color profile. That's where the printer profile would be listed. Okay. Correct colors using color profile. So this would be installed you don't, through you the. You have one. Right. Correct. So, so it, it would automatically appear if you've gone through our setup. Yeah, because you'd set it as a default, correct? So you well, would. Well, no. What it happens is, is when Corel reaches out to the printer, it sees that profile associated inside Windows. Gotcha. And it says, oh, that I guess I should use it. And I got to tell you, there's a big difference between printing with that profile and not printing with that profile. And it's uh, it's fair to say light and day difference in terms of color output, David? Yes, sir. Okay, and that's one of the great tangible benefits of being a Condi Systems client is that they've done all that legwork for you so you get good color. And the, the chief complaint that I get from clients that do sublimation is I can never get the colors right. And when I ask them who they bought their printer from, from it's never a Condi Systems client. <laughs> so if they, well, I would say that every body crack has to go through a learning process to manage color. You're, you're, you're not going to instantly know it, and you've been very helpful today. Um, and we're here as that resource to, to guide you to matching color. 
but essentially using our profile, you're going to get accurate color, but to match spot colors, you need a color chart. There you go. All right. So we're going to, I'm going to go ahead and stop the recorded portion of the webcast and then I'm going to run a couple polls and then we're going to do a promotion and then we'll uh, open it up for Q and A and I'll stay and answer questions till you guys are out of them. So, all right. So let's go ahead and stop the recording right now.